God's people, as people who are just walking with, with Jesus and just trusting God. You know, again, we have another week. We had another week where, again, tragedy struck our nation. And, um, you know, this stuff hurts. Anytime lives are taken and just senseless acts of, 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 of sin like this are committed, we, we can't help but hurt. Uh, that doesn't mean we stop praying. Amen. That doesn't mean we stop trusting God. Amen. Uh, let me encourage you during times like this, read Isaiah 40. That's one of those go-to passages where we're reminded of the greatness of God and that uh, he's got this. And someone asked me at the coffee house this week, like, what, what are your thoughts? And, and I want to I frame it like this, if I could. This is, just, this is just me speaking. I'm not representing the church when I say this. I'm just speaking as, uh, as a follower of Jesus and, and a pastor. It, it hurts when you hear of news like this, but I always ask myself the question too, how come we don't hear of more instances like this? We live in a world where men and women have the freedom to choose, and yet I'm reminded that God's restraining hand is still active in our world. And it's not like I'm surprised when this happens. I'm surprised when more events like this don't happen. And we need to keep that in mind. God is in control. God permits things like this. He's not the author of it. He's not saying, you know, I'm going to be the cause of it. But in order for free moral agents to have free moral choices, these things happen. My question is, why don't they happen more? It's evidence that God's restraining hand is still there. But we're also reminded to our own of our own mortality and that this world is not all there is. Just like Jesus said to the disciples when that tower fell on those people and killed those lives, thank God you weren't under that tower. And so we pray for our nation. We pray for the family members that lost loved ones and friends that lost friends. And we're praying for these senseless acts. To We don't want to hear about them, but we're going to. But we praise God that he's still in control, whether we acknowledge it or not, he is. And his restraining influence is still present in our world. And we have today to point people to Jesus, because ultimately he is the one that will heal us. He's the one that will make every wrong right. He was the one that will bring some sort of uh, meaning out of this meaninglessness. And so we pray and we keep trusting. Amen. I'm not giving up hope. I'm going to continue to point people to Christ and still grieve with those who grieve, but I'm going to point to the hope that's in Christ Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we give you this morning, we give you our hearts, we give you our lives, we give you the, the current state of affairs, we give you the, the, the political powers that are at war, we give you the, 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 the issues that are warring within people's hearts, Lord. We just pray that somehow, some way, you are magnified, you are glorified in all things. We come to you with questions, sometimes we don't get answers, and we just get you saying, trust me. We get you saying, press into me. We get you saying, I'm still here and I'm still doing something. And Father, we want to trust that. And so we're going to lean on you for, for all things. And we know that somehow you will bring triumph out of tragedy. You will bring uh, dancing from mourning. You will bring laughter from tears. And we're going to bank on that, Father. So thank you for, for giving us this time together as family where we can come and we can we can weep together, we can rejoice together, we can look to Jesus, our only hope together, and we pray that you are glorified and magnified in this time, this morning, and we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Turn your outlines, if you would, in your Bibles to, to 1 John 4 in your outlines. There's going to be a, some fill-in-the-blanks that I hope that uh, I catch all those for you. Um, I am an uh, Arizona State University graduate. This is not confession time. I'm not confessing something to you. I'm just, you know, go Sun Devils, right? So I was a history major from, from Arizona State University. I almost got a double major in, with religious studies attached to it. Now, you're probably thinking Arizona State University and religious studies don't necessarily go hand in hand with each other. So I took a lot of religious studies courses at ASU and... Um, I remember one of the first ones I took was a New Testament class with, with Dr. Emerson. And, and I sat in class, and the very first day of class, Dr. Emerson pretty much said that if you come into this class with a preconceived set of religious beliefs, 
my goal is to rock your world. My goal is to shake your beliefs. My goal is to uh, uh, lead you into a realm of unbelief and doubt that you're different leaving this class than, you, than who you were coming into it. And I thought to myself, this is going to be fun. You know, at that time, I was a few years old in Jesus. So I was a, I was a young, young uh, believer in, in Christ at this time. And I thought to myself, well, this is going to be a challenge. I went to an intro to Christianity class. The professor had the same first goal of saying, I'm going to shake your faith in this class. And so I'm thinking to myself, ASU Religious Studies, all right, here we go, put that seatbelt on. And so what these professors began to do in classes of hundreds of students is basically discredit the Bible, discredit the teachings of Christ. Uh, I remember the, the, the second class, you know, Dr. Emerson would say, nowhere in the Bible does Jesus ever claim to be God. And 200 kids are sitting in this class, and no one says anything except for me. I go, what about this passage? And what about this passage? And what about this passage? And Dr. Emerson changed the subject. Nowhere in the Bible does the Apostle Paul discuss the deity of Jesus. What about this passage? And after two or three classes, Dr. Emerson pulled me aside and said, let's go grab lunch. And there I am at the MU having lunch with Dr. Emerson, who is this uh, world-renowned theologian and New Testament expert. And he's basically pitching this idea that I should go to Harvard Divinity School, Yale Divinity School, and, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, no, I'm called to be a pastor. But what he recognized and what came out in our conversation was that most students that come to his class don't have any foundation of why they believe what they believe. And when someone doesn't know why they believe what they believe, their foundation is easily shaken. That's why the statistics... For students that enter into university coming from a faith background, leave the university with no faith left intact. Because there is no foundation that is laid in our homes, in our churches, in the lives of young people. And they go out into the world and when they're attacked, it is such a discouraging and disheartening experience. And if you listen to the testimony of men and women coming out of university, they will tell you, yeah, walking in, you know, I thought I knew what I believe, but I was challenged, I was shaken, and I no longer believe this. This is, this is disappointing. This is, this is disheartening. That, what, what are we selling People. What are we what are we offering people? What are we giving our children? What are we giving our adults? I mean, if someone came up to you today on the street and said, show me where Jesus said he was God. How many of us would be able to go here, here, here? Or would we be like, I don't know. It's in there somewhere. Well, how do you know this is to be trusted? How do you know this isn't just something created by man as a as a. Uh, an opiate for the masses, in the words of Karl Marx. See, ladies and gentlemen, there is spiritual deception all around us. Every day you wake up to a world that is set on sabotaging your trust in God, your faith in Christ, and it's trying to diminish the power of the cross. And I am here as your friend, as your brother, as your pastor, as a fellow journey, a journeyman in this thing that we call faith. I am here to establish us in the most important thing we can be established in, and that is the person and work of Jesus Christ. And to let you know that it can be objectively verified, it's objectively true, and we live in a world that's going to try to sabotage that. I want to strengthen you in this. Because it doesn't matter just how you love, it matters what you believe. Matter of fact, write those two words down, love and belief. They are not opposed to each other. They're not antagonistic to each other. 
we're in first john which talks about loving people and i'm all about love and we should talk about love some more but love the way god wants you to love is nothing without a belief in jesus fueling that love and there's nothing but a love for jesus and a belief in jesus that doesn't amount to loving people like jesus loves us the two are connected see john's just got done telling us the importance of loving one another now in chapter four he's going to tell us the belief is also important because to have proper belief means to have a proper love and to have a proper love means to have a proper belief and wouldn't you know it the belief that john points to is in the person and work of jesus christ write down those two words in your notes jesus christ because if you don't have Jesus, you don't have squat. But if you have Jesus, you have everything. And it's exactly that. I mean, I can, uh, I, I've read books by, by non-Christian authors. I've read books by, by atheist thinkers. I've gone to lectures by, from Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion years ago. And, you know, these, these men like Dawkins and Sam Harris, you know, they'll challenge uh, the religions they'll challenge christianity and judaism and islam and they'll talk about how it's nothing but violence and 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 yet they'll talk about god but they won't talk about jesus see god is a safe topic because god can mean anything to anyone but the moment you insert jesus into the conversation things get a little dicey right but it's exactly jesus and belief in Jesus that is tantamount for clearing up a lot of the dis disillusionment out there, a lot of the confusion out there. If you get Jesus right, you're going to get everything right. And this is what we call the Christological test. Some of you are like, how do you even spell that? I don't know. Look it up on Google later. The Christological test, the, the, the theology of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is important. Even Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 2, specifically in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I have basically concluded in my life that I'm not going to make anything known to you except for Jesus. Like, here's Paul, well-educated. Paul, who's had a varied amount of experiences in his life, grew up in a very wealthy environment, he has concluded that at the end of the day, he's not going to make anything known to anybody except for Jesus Christ. That's how important this is. And especially coming out of chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians where he says, God takes the wisdom of this world and turns it into foolishness. And he takes the strength of the world and he makes it weak. Because he is infinitely smarter. He is infinitely wiser. He's infinitely stronger. So how can we get to a point where we can say, like Paul, I'm not going to make anything known to this world except for Jesus? How do we get to a point where we even, by stating that, believe it? Are, are secure within our own beings that, yeah, what we believe is the right thing. And, and especially in a culture where there's thousands of gods being thrown at us. Thousands of idols wooing us for their, our attention. And so let me start by this. Let's look at the first point in your notes, and we're going to go through this quickly. It's this. It's the false Jesus of a dead faith. We live literally in a world that is a spiritual smorgasbord. I mean, even admitting that, I'm hungry right now. There's a spiritual buffet awaiting every single one of us, but we have to be careful because just because someone says Jesus doesn't mean it's good. Right? Like, Oh, my favorite rapper, you know, who's in the misogyny and drive-by killings and gang rapes. But he mentions Jesus, so he's got to be okay, right? Wrong. Isn't it funny, like, how quick we are to, to make people into Christian celebrities just because they mention Jesus? Number one, consider the Jesus of the uh, non-biblical portrait. Writers like Marcus Borg, Bishop John Shelby Spong, and Rice, who wrote the, uh, the, the Interview with a Vampire series, who came to know Jesus and has written her own biography of Jesus, which is really a non-biblical portrait of Jesus. But probably the most favorite is a guy named Dan Brown. The Da Vinci Code, 
Angels and Demons, Inferno, all those horrible movies, they are really bad. And not only that, there's a bad theology underlying them because what Dan Brown purports is really a new Gnosticism. Write that word down, look at it later. G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M, Gnosticism. Basically saying, you know, that Jesus really didn't come in the flesh. He was just a spirit just kind of emanated into our world. And, and you don't have to worry about anything of the flesh. It's your spirit you need to nourish, but you can go ahead and live like hell through your flesh. And it's just this weird belief. And then questioning Jesus' marital status and did he really die on the cross and the whole lie of the early church that women were really outcasts and it's a man-controlled thing and all that theology that comes through the Da Vinci Code. Now, I'm going to tell you what. I read the books. The books were fascinating fiction. But the problem is in the intro of the book, Dan Brown says, even though this is fiction, it's all based on fact. And how many Christians picked up and go, oh, well, Dan Brown says it's fact. It must be fact. There's a Greek word that I use in context of this. It's, it's called hogwash. <laughs> I was going to say BS, but there's kids in the audience, so. I just said it. Well, I might have said the whole thing. You never know. But uh, uh, this is not the Baptist crowd. That's the 1045 group. But, but there are people, there are people out there that give you a portrait of Jesus, but their portrait of Jesus has nothing to do with what has been revealed in the scriptures. Because the New Testament is the only authorized biography of Christ. So be careful. Number two, there's the Jesus of the world religions. I mean, Islam talks about Jesus, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism point to, point to things that were taught by Jesus. Uh, you've got people like Gandhi and the Dalai Lama. Uh, oh, and the go golf with the Dalai Lama, that would be the best. But that's another story for another time. But Gandhi, who was turned away at a Baptist church by the ushers, because they saw his attire, concluded what his religion was, and said he wasn't welcome there. But even Gandhi, even though he was rejected by the church, still pointed to the wise teachings of Jesus. Even within Islam, there is this understanding that Jesus was a prophet. But again, what the world religions do is they may relegate Jesus to be a teacher or be a prophet or a good moral leader, but they don't conclude that he was Lord God, Son of God, the Messiah, Savior, etc., etc. And so there's this Jesus that's this teacher, philosopher, but nothing more than that. Number three, there's Jesus of the cults and the occult. The cults or, and the occult. Basically, groups that would claim to believe in the Bible, groups that would claim to believe in some aspect of of Christian theology, groups like Jehovah's Witnesses, groups like Mormons, groups like Roman Catholicism, groups like, um, I mean, the list can go on, teachers like Deepak Chopra or Oprah Winfrey, Mary Baker Eddy, where there's enough there, you go, they're saying all the same words. They're saying, you know, baptized, and they're saying saved, and they're saying, you know, the Bible, and they're even quoting from these things, and we buy it hook, line, and sinker without inspecting it. I'm going to tell you right now, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in Jesus as God. They believe that he was Michael the Archangel behind the scenes, thought, that gig's boring, I'm going to become Jesus now on earth. Uh, and basically is this manifestation not of God, but a God, and pointing you to Jehovah, and et cetera, et cetera. It's just an aberrant belief in Orthodox Christian beliefs. Mormonism's the same way. It teaches that not only is there one God, there's many gods, and you too can become a God. I mean, could that be why it's one of the biggest growing religions in the world? I mean, who doesn't want that? Wait, you're saying I can become a god? I mean, it wasn't that the lie in the garden of Genesis chapter 3? You shall be like him. And even Adam go, okay. And then we know the rest of the story. Just because someone says Jesus doesn't mean you just accept it. Just because someone says, oh, look in the Bible doesn't mean you accept it. 
See, there are cults, and there are the cults out there, that are very, very uh, dangerous because their belief systems look so much like Christianity. What about the last group? Jesus of pop culture. You know, the sports star that says, I'm going to thank my big guy upstairs for this victory. What, what do you mean by that? Big guy upstairs? Like, where's that found in the scriptures? Does, does the Psalms have words like that? Or the, or the playboy model who sports across her chest. You know, Jesus is my homeboy. Oh, she's got to love Jesus, right? Because look, she's got Jesus. So many people are like, my kids even will ask, Dad, is so-and-so a Christian? And I say, I don't know. Like, just because they say Jesus, just because they talk about the Bible. I mean, just the other day, I watched a video clip of a Killers concert. The Killers, that's a band, for those of you that don't know. uh, In London, where Woody Harrelson, who's an outspoken atheist, came out on stage and quoted Mark chapter 9 before one of the Killers songs. Oh, is Woody a believer now? Good. And then what the church does is it finds out who's a believer, and all of a sudden they usher them into the limelight. Even Paul, who was a celebrity back in his day, was taken away to the Arabian wilderness for three years after his conversion so God could do a work in him. Shame on us for throwing people into the limelight too quickly just because they say, I'm a Christian. See, there's this spiritual supermarket around us, and the question is, what Jesus should we choose? And you know which one we choose? The one that best best fits our lifestyle. You know what Jesus we choose is the one that best fits my life, where I feel good, but the moment that Jesus starts to convict me, I'm going to ditch him. Because I'm going to go to the next Jesus that's a little easier to digest. Diet Jesus. Don't don't we all want diet Jesus? Like, Jesus, you know what? I'm glad you saved me, but don't tell me how to live my life. Right, like that roommate that you can put up with, but the moment they start crossing into your boundary in the fridge of, of where your food's at, you're like, I'm getting rid of you. So let's stay away from the social activist Jesus, the merely a prophet Jesus, the great teacher Jesus, the religious genius Jesus, the pacifist Jesus, the rebel Jesus, the Republican Jesus, the Marxist Jesus, and the vegetarian Jesus, shall we? And let's get back to the authorized version of Jesus found in the scriptures. Because this is where the bread and butter's at. This is where the the heart of what God wants us to understand this morning. 1 John chapter 4. My prayer is that the message Peter preached in Acts 2 where he says, it is this Jesus who is both Lord and Christ. This is the Jesus I want you to believe. That's my prayer for us. Amen? 1 John 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. That's good. That's kind of like what I've been talking about, right? But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. How many times have we heard that quoted? I'm going to give you the context of it here in a moment. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Don't you love how neatly... John compartmentalizes belief. There's the belief that's of the Spirit of God, and then there's the belief that's the Spirit of air. There's no, like, 50 categories. There's no, like, 500 options. There's either the, the voice of God reflected in the Spirit of truth, or there's the voice of the devil 
known as also the, the spirit of antichrist that comes through and that it's the spirit of error. It's one or, one, or, one or the other. And there's four things I want us to look at this morning that are going to help solidify to know, to determine if we're from God. Are we of God? Is what we're discussing from God? These are the tests of discernment. These are the tests to objectively look at why we believe what we believe. And they come out of these six verses. Number one, there is a life of testing that every follower of Jesus is called to embrace. We live in a culture that... that continues to spout this, this, this theme of don't you dare question, don't you dare challenge, lest you be labeled intolerant, lest you be uh, labeled narrow-minded, lest you be narrow, you know, uh, labeled bigoted. And so we live in this culture where we're basically you know, uh, emasculated from even challenging anything. And the Bible says, test the spirits. Other places it says, examine the faith. In other places it says, hold these things up to the light of Scripture to see if they're true. Because I love what Paul says in Romans 3, let God be true and every man a liar. Because here's the thing, there is spiritual deception around us, which requires me and us corporately to exercise spiritual discernment. Write that word down, discernment. Some in the church would even label discernment a spiritual gift. And I'm going to tell you right now, I have the gift of discernment. And I say that because when I'm talking to someone, there is this supernatural experience that goes on in our transaction where I sit there and go, this person is not of God. This, what's going on right now, this is not from the Holy Spirit. This does not represent the Scriptures accurately. And there's something within me that God has hardwired into me spiritually when I was a young believer that I'd come across people and I'd sit there and go, I don't have a good feeling about this. But it's not about whether I had chili the night before. That's not the issue, okay? While there may be an unsettledness, that unsettledness is rooted in the Word. This, this uncomfortableness is rooted in God's Scriptures. And so what we need to realize is that though I may have the gift of discernment, all of us as followers of Christ are called to be a discerning people. And that's why John says there is nothing wrong with being biblical in your approach to what people are saying, what people are writing, what people are filming, what people are whatever. You need to be biblical about this, but it is necessary. And I can't tell you how much... There is being touted today as Christian, and Christians are buying into it. I'm sitting there going, no, this is not good. This is not healthy. And I'm not going to name names or call people out, but there, you have to be careful. And so not every spiritual leader or teacher is a credible teacher. I would never want someone to believe what I say just because I say it. And so here's what I'm saying. Test me. I want you to know I am a pastor that believes in the infallibility of God's truth. I am a pastor who believes in the infallibility of who God is, his character, the way he works. But I am a fallible person, and sometimes I may be mistaken in something I say or something I communicate. Give me the benefit of the doubt. Come back to me and say, you said this. I will, not take a, uh, 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 I will not take it personally. I will take it as you doing your due diligence to say, here's what you said, here's what the Word of God says. How do you reconcile the two? Because guess what? It's been known to happen. I remember one of my first Bible studies I led. I was so nervous, like green, right? Totally inexperienced, wet behind the ears. Here I am leading this Bible study, and I misquoted a psalm, and some girl beelined it up to me after the Bible study and said, you said this, and here's what the Word of God says. I'm like, did I really say that? I thought I was certainly going to hell for that mistake, you know. And, and I appreciated so much what that gal did because it forced me to go, this is an important work to communicate God's Word. This is an important task, and I don't want to treat it willy-nilly, and I want to take it seriously, but also I'm a fallible person. So, so test me. 
I, I am so honored to be your teacher and to be your pastor and to take us to God's word, but I am fallible. But the material we handle is infallible. I'm the problem. There was a book given to me early on when I was a Christian called The Agony of Deceit by a guy named Michael Horton. And what they did is they basically took all like the TBN preachers and basically said, here's what they're teaching and here's how it doesn't line up with the Bible. And here's what they did before they even published the book. They went back to every TBN preacher, author, and said, this is what you said this is what the Bible says. Do you stand by what you said? And all of them said, yes, I stand by what I said, even though it doesn't line up with Scripture. And they said, just so you know, this thing's going to the print. We're publishing it, and now the world knows. Just because someone is a spiritual teacher doesn't mean they're a credible teacher. Okay? Test the spirits. Be a discerning people. We are called to be doctrine detectives. We are called to be theological investigators. We are to have a certain level of spiritual skepticism. My three favorite gifts, cynicism, sarcasm, and skepticism. I love those things. I say that jokingly. But in a sense, you are to be a discerning person. False prophets have always been around us, even in the time of Moses. Look at Deuteronomy 13 sometime, Deuteronomy 18. If someone comes along, Moses says, and delivers a message that's not from God, guess what that prophet deserves? Death. Death. Someone comes claiming to represent God, communicating his truth, and their prophecy doesn't line up with what God has revealed. They deserve to die. Aren't you glad that doesn't happen today? We'd be driving down the street and there'd be people dead all along the way. And don't sit there and go, but we've never been warned of this. Jesus warned the church. Paul warned the church. Wolves will come in dressed as sheep. And they will teach false things to lead people astray. And Paul even says, even the elect. Meaning, even those who think they're in, right? And they're, 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 they're teaching so deceptive that even the elect are like, that sounds pretty good. Paul, Jesus, Peter, Jude. Jude chapter, verse 3 says, contend for the faith. Because there's deceivers among us. This doesn't mean we go looking for error. This is not what I'm purporting here. What I'm saying is, though, when something drops into your lap, claiming to be from God, you have an obligation to test it. Amen? Amen? And don't tell me, well, that's your job, Pastor. I mean, I love that part of my job. But all of us need to be a discerning people. And I'm going to tell you this. this is a, you, you ready to tweet? You ready to tweet something? Okay. The Twitterverse is going to light up. I can just tell right now. Unbelief is a mark of spiritual maturity that's as important as belief. You like that? Unbelief is a mark of spiritual maturity as important as belief. Because what does John say? How does he start this section? Do not believe. You're welcome. A life of testing. Line it up to the scriptures. Now, we can go into why the scriptures are the supernatural words from God to us. I mean, I could spend two hours up here talking about that there's no other book of antiquity as attested to than the, the Bible. There's no book of antiquity that has the authorship that has been backed up by miracles and things that are unexplainable. I mean... You can start with the biggest miracle of all, the empty tomb in the Middle East. There's, there's no Jesus that's buried. He's been risen again. He's, he's, he, he is no longer buried. He's risen. His disciples 
saw the empty tomb. They saw the risen Savior. Their lives were set on fire to preach this message because last time I checked, these 12 men seemed to be somewhat competent. They didn't suffer from any kind of mental in- illness. And if they believed, uh, if they didn't believe what they purported, purported to be truth, then they'd be liars. And whoever died for a lie, whoever suffered the way these disciples did for something they knew to not be true. And the science and the archaeology and the discoveries that continue to be uncovered in the Middle East continue to substantiate the Bible as being what it is, not just a great literary book, but being the very words of God to us. And not just in written form, but in the person who is the word, Jesus Christ. Which brings us to our second point. The life of confessing. So verse 1 don't believe, right? Have a level of unbelief because not everything that comes forth is necessarily from God, from people who are spiritual teachers and leaders, but you're to test things. And then verse 2, notice what John says, by this you're going to know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is God, has come in the flesh, is from God. There's the test. And I'm going to tell you, this is the capital T, capital H, capital E test. If you get Jesus wrong, you're going to get it all wrong. This is why I can sit down with somebody and I'll ask them, what do you believe about Jesus? And they'll tell me and I'll tell that person 95% of what their theology is about. Tell me what you believe about Jesus. And I'm going to tell you what your theological worldview looks like. Because Jesus, who he is, why he came, what he did, is the most important topic we can discuss. Here's the question to you. What do you believe about Jesus? Because there are people here right now in this room who don't believe what the Bible teaches about Jesus. And that's okay. We're glad you're here. My prayer is that God would move you to a place where you do understand what is spoken of, what is taught, what is written about Jesus. Because this is not just about recognition of Jesus' identity. This is about profession of faith in Him in a very bold, very open manner. This is a a confession that's not just verbal, but something that comes from within, that's heart-stirring, soul-engaging, mind-numbing, that... What you believe about Jesus is not just acknowledged, but it is confessed, meaning there's an inner commitment to what you say you believe. This is why Peter, Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And, you know, the disciples are like, oh, some people say this, some people say this. And then Jesus says, who do you say that I am? I'm going to tell you right now, the most important question anybody can answer. And what does Peter say? And this is where you go, good job, Peter. Like, you're going, oh, no, Peter's talking. Peter's going to say something. Oh, Lord, help us. What's going to come out of his mouth? Who do you say to them? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Peter. <laughs> so the disciples are like, oh, good, he answered correctly. Yeah! We don't have to do 100 laps around the temple. Good, all right. <laughs> Wrong! Take some laps! Nothing like theological discipline, right? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Peter, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. This has been given to you from heaven. And I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. What will the gates of hell not be able to stand against? The confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That is what Jesus is building his church on. Not some sort of plot of ground, not some sort of religion, not the papal system. What Jesus will build the church on, according to Matthew 16, is the confession, this inner belief that is a commitment to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. We got this. We've got this. So everyone that believes in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, 
is from God. And any spirit that denies is not from God. Do you think the confession of who Jesus is is important? Yes. See, and we go on confessing this. We live with this confession. We sing this confession. We preach this confession. We, we cry over this confession. We, we rejoice over this confession. We, we point people to this confession because there's no other name under heaven by which men or women will be saved but in the name of Jesus. Right? No one gets to the Father but by me because He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Amen? There is no mediator between God and man but Him who is Jesus. Do you see why this is important? You see why this gets people crucified? You see why there's attacks against this? You can keep it safe and talk about God and be all spiritually general like that, but Jesus is tantamount. Fundamental Christian doctrine that can never be compromised concerns the divine human person of Jesus, the Son of God. Mormons get it wrong. Jehovah's Witnesses get it wrong. Buddhists get it wrong. Hindus get it wrong. Deepak gets it wrong. Oprah gets it wrong. LeBron gets it wrong. Donald gets it wrong. We need to get it right. Okay? We need to get it right. This is why there was a monk 500 years, years ago that went to the Church of Wittenberg and posted 95 theses on that door 500 years ago and started the Protestant Reformation. This month, 500 years ago, I would love to be in Germany right now because there's people that are partying and they're probably just partying for the sake of partying. And they're like, oh, what's this about Martin Luther? I don't care. Give me another beer. Right? Like, okay, that's fine. But there are believers that are converging in Germany this month because one man had the balls to stand up against the church and say, what you are teaching about Jesus, what you're teaching about salvation, what you're teaching about the Bible is wrong. And this guy was a bulldog, and he went on October 31st, 1517, posted those objections to the church, 95 of them. I'm getting off easy when I only got like 5 or 10. But someone goes, 95, because on October 31st, that night when he posted them, he knew the next day was All Saints Day, and there'd be a parade down the streets passing that church. And it was like a billboard put up for everyone to see. He was very, very deliberate in what he did and why he did it. And this started on a magnificent scale, the Protestant Reformation. And you here are recipients of this man's bulldoggedness. Only the Holy Spirit This is why it's of the Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can honor Jesus in a way that glorifies God and reflects Jesus appropriately. The Spirit that doesn't honor Jesus is not the Spirit that's from God or of the truth. This is the Spirit of the Antichrist or error. The Spirit has come to make Jesus look awesome. John 14, John 16. Here's what's amazing is that the demons got it right when they recognized the deed of Jesus when he was here on earth. The demons got it right and said, yeah, you're the son of God. Though they didn't worship him. James even points to the belief of the demons and says they even believe but, and they shudder, but that's not a salvific belief. And I'm saying, are there people out there who call themselves Christians that there's a level that the demons believe more about Jesus than Christians do? And unfortunately, yes. He is the center. He is the hub. He is the one in which everything radiates from Him. Our confession or denial of the Son indicates whether we are inspired by the Spirit or not. Or not. If I was a pastor who did not talk about Jesus, you have every right to question the Spirit that's energizing my, my, my talk. This is how we know. Is this a Spirit that's energized by God or is this a Spirit that's energized by the Antichrist? And this, is, this issue is a, 
It's at stake with every generation. The humanity and divinity of Jesus. Jesus was 100% human. He was 100% divine. How the two are inextricably linked in one person, we don't know. This is a, a, a mystery. But he has always been God. There's this thing called the Trinity that we affirm. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All co-eternal. All co-substantial. All knowing. All present. Everywhere active. This is the one God that we celebrate who makes himself known in three persons. It wasn't like there was this body on earth that God says, I'm going to inhabit that. No, you know, th- this, this body that was just looking for, you know, oh, I'm just going to wander out there and hopefully be filled with something. No, God created this unique body from a mother, earthly mother, without a, an earthly father, so that he could not transmit the sin to the human race. Look at Romans chapter 5 sometime and read more about that. But all of a sudden, this supernatural birth, we call the virgin birth, happens. And now we have him able to represent humanity to the fullest, but not forsaking any of his divinity. Philippians chapter 2. He emptied himself, took on human flesh, dwelt among us, went to the cross, the lowliest of all death, so that he could be exalted to the highest place, and that one day every tongue will confess and every knee will bow and and say that he is Lord. What do you believe about Jesus? Before the Reformation 500 years ago, there's this guy named Athanasius. Third century. I know I'm getting all historical on you guys. I'm sorry. Here's what I love about the early church. They literally fought for these beliefs. Athanasius hung out with a guy named St. Nick. You guys know who St. Nicholas is? Who now we celebrate as Santa Claus. There's a whole story there. We won't go into it. But St. Nick and Athanasius were at the same conference in the third century. And some guy comes in and says, no, Jesus wasn't fully God. And you know what happened? They got into a fist fight. Can you imagine like if I came like one Sunday and I had a black eye and people were like, what happened to you? Well, someone denied Jesus and we got into it, man. I'm like, I got out with this, right? Like, these guys went to blows with each other because of how serious this was. Well, Athanasius, after that encounter, wrote this, and this is part of the Athanasian Creed. Listen to these words. It is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe faithfully the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man, God of the essence of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and man of the essence of the mother, born in the world, perfect God, perfect man, who although he is God and man, yet is not two, but one Christ. That will get you beat up. And I'm glad he got a black eye for for this. Because now we're the recipients of a rich tradition, ladies and gentlemen. Amen? Who is Jesus? I'm going to tell you right now that unfortunately sometimes we bill our faith as people need to become so literate with the Bible, so literate when it comes to spiritual gifts, so literate when it comes to end times. The greatest foundation you can establish in any young believer's life is letting, teaching them who Jesus is. Who is Jesus? Start there. Talk about his divinity, talk about his humanity. The, the scriptures, I've devoted my life to studying the scriptures, even I don't understand all the Bible. And it's okay when you throw this volume in someone's lap. I mean, talk about intimidating as a young believer, like, welcome to Christianity, read this. And they're like, this will come in time. Teach them about Jesus. And maybe in the teaching, you learn some things about Jesus. And maybe this is good for you, even though you're too proud to admit it, right? Let's talk about Jesus because it would be good for me too. Yeah, we know. Teach them about Christ. And when you teach them about Christ, when you understand Christ, and it's like the, the, the world of the scriptures begin to unfold. Because if he's the Messiah, he's everything that the prophets and the law point to. If he's, if he's the, the Messiah, then all the things that are spoken of in the Old Testament point to Jesus and find their fruition in him. You see how Jesus is important? And this is why we live in our culture. Ladies and gentlemen, I am, I'm not giving up hope. But Jesus is the hope. 
And we live in a culture that becomes more and more fragmented. And I'm going to tell you right now that we have gotten to a place where I'm sitting there going, I'm praying for our leaders, I'm praying for our, our, our policies and our politics and this and that. But if we continue to cater to everybody's whim because we live in such an entitled society, well, you need to make laws for me. You need to make laws for my sexuality. You need to make laws for my spending. You need to make laws for my habits. And everything becomes so selfish, there's no way you can uphold a society if everyone gets what they want. This is why God has designed His truth to not just be present in Jesus, not just be present in the Word, but be present in our consciences where we have to realize that we don't get everything we want and what we need is exactly what God has already showed us. Stop suppressing the truth and unrighteousness and get back to the heart of it. That's the answer. But this thing continues to spiral out of control. Why? Because no one wants to change their lives according to what God wants. they just rather have you cater to them and they think they're getting off free when in reality they pass from this world into the next. They realize that they have not worshipped the one true God. They have worshipped a God after their own image, their own liking, their own appetite. And now I'm preaching and there's the inner Baptist in me that's coming out. I'm, I'm telling you guys, this, it, it, it doesn't get better. Unless we tell people, no, this is not God's way. No, this is not God's design. No, this is not God's heart. No, this is not God's will. We live in a culture where people have never been told no. Well, we don't want to offend somebody. Tell that to them on their way to hell. And we'll be surprised who's in heaven and who isn't. And we will stand, I think, with momentary shame before God because we did not tell people what they needed to hear. We told them what they wanted to hear. Number three, a life of overcoming. You know, there's those moments as a pastor, you thought, here comes that email. You know, as much as I put myself out there, I rarely get those, so let's not start. (laughs) (laughs) Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, This really, I think what 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 I'm speaking about resonates, I'm not gonna say with all of us, but with most of us, And this is going to sound arrogant, but I'm going to back it up with my last point. That if you respond to what I'm saying, you're of the Spirit of God. Doesn't that sound arrogant? There's the art of listening that we're going to get to, but I'm I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. What about overcoming? Look what it says in verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. Write these two words down, if you would, under this point. Rejection perseverance because greater is he who is in you to reject false teaching greater is he who is in you to lead you into truth to guide you into what is right to lead you to that which is god honoring christ exalting greater is he who is in you who is giving you the stamina to reject things because rejecting things may mean there's going to be opposition because it's not what everyone's buying. It's not what everyone's drinking. So there is this spirit within you, we will call the Holy Spirit, that is given to you as a gift the moment you believe in Christ as Lord and Savior. God deposits Himself within you by means of the Spirit. That is awesome. And that Spirit is designed to be active within you, to lead you into truth, to allow you to be discerning when error comes in, so you reject that which is not from God. Greater is He who is in you than He who is in the world. Amen? But He's also the Spirit that allows you to persevere in the truth. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You will persevere. You will be persistent. You will press on. This is what God says. You don't throw in the towel. You don't renounce your faith. Because the person that renounces their faith is a person that never had faith to begin with. 
The Bible doesn't t- teach you can be saved and then maybe lose it tomorrow. The Bible teaches once you're saved, you're always saved. John 10 is a great place to go to this week if you want to look more about that. But once you're saved, you're always saved. And a renouncement or rejection of Christ shows that you never really believed it to begin with. Greater is he who is in you to reject. Greater is he who is in you to persevere. You are more than overcomers. By believing in Christ, you will be attacked. The opposition of Satan, the world system that daily assaults us, false teachers that seek to seduce us, faulty worldviews that attempt to confuse us, and our own sinfulness that yearns to enslave us is divinely ordained to fall because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We have a champion, Jesus. We have a victor, Jesus. We have a source of power that all of these enemies from hell cannot overcome. His name is Jesus. We have a spirit within us. And this one who is infinitely stronger and wiser and greater now is forever dwelling within you. If you have Jesus. Wow. And and I want to tell you guys this. Do not be imitated uh, intimidated by the world. As a, as a 20-year-old sitting across from this world-renowned professor who teaches New Testament, you better believe I had the jitters. I had the nerves. But I'll tell you what, there was something within me as we were talking very civilly, very respectfully, that what I was saying was of the truth. And it was the moments like that and moments when I've stood against other people, atheists or whatever worldview, that I have thought to myself, Thank you, God, for the spirit that is in me that's greater than the one in the world. Because the world's going to try to intimidate you. They're going to try to argue you down, debate you into a hole, and try to put you into a corner. And I'm going to tell you right now, trust God for the intellectual capacity to stand against any worldview system or any world system that objects to Christ as Lord and Savior. Grow in these things. Fuel these things. Feed them. Quit binge watching your Netflix show and dive into the Word and know what you know. Right? Watch online debates between savvy Christian speakers and atheists. Watch and learn from them. Pick up stuff. One of my favorites, Ravi Zacharias. If you don't know Ravi Zacharias, pick up Ravi Zacharias' stuff. Hindu changed into a follower of Jesus who now travels the world and And not only is it just cool because of his accent, but what's cooler is the content. Ravi Zacharias, C.S. Lewis, Philip Yancey. These are men that I have looked to and go, wow, they frame it. They, They set it up in a way that I can understand. And if you don't get the first go around, it's kind of like Shakespeare. You ever read Shakespeare and you get in two chapters, you're like, I have no clue what's going on here. Then all of a sudden, the third chapter, you're like, okay, I think I know what's happening. And then there's murder and intrigue and, you know, romance and wow, right? You know, you're not going to get it right off the bat, but discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness and continue to avail yourself to it. That's all I got to tell you. Just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Last point, a life of listening. And again, this may sound arrogant, but it is not because you have John saying, look at verse 6. We are from God, and he who knows God listens to us. Right? Like, like, who are you? Well, let me just tell you who John was. He was a disciple of Jesus. Not just a disciple, he was part of the inner core group of Jesus' posse. And he heard Jesus, he watched Jesus, he observed Jesus do miracles. If anyone's got insider information on who Jesus was and what Jesus did, if there's any validity to Jesus, it's John. And this man not only was a witness to all these things, like he says in chapter 1, he's an eyewitness of what Jesus did. He went to his grave preaching without waver, the message that Christ is Lord and God. And any pastor, preacher, teacher 
that doesn't get on their own thing and tell you about what they believe, but takes you to the Word, is someone worth listening to. This is why I'm unashamed to say, I am so thankful that this is a faith community right here that knows when we come together, we're going to be in the Word. Because guess what? It doesn't matter what I say. What matters is what God has said. And for you to say, I'm, gonna, I'm going to submit to Pastor Scott's teaching on a Sunday morning because we know that he wants to get at the heart of what God's saying so that what is not understandable maybe to us at one point, I can help make it understandable for his glory to exalt Jesus and for our good. Amen? So in the sense, I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what I believe. I'm going to point to the scriptures. And this is what we call in some places expositional teaching. This is a rarity in our, our culture. People come back and they'll go, I visited 10 churches and boy, I tell you what, there is a deficit of the word of God out there. There, there are, I went before, plant, you know, I've planted a couple churches, did college ministry, but in between those seasons, I would go visit churches. You walk into the, those churches with a Bible, people thought you're walking in with a Uzi or something. It's like, what is that? Right? Like, oh, you know, just because you have Bible in your name, you know, just because you have Christian in the title of your church, doesn't mean you're those things. But here's what, if, we don't, if we're not called Missio Day Bible Church, someone sits through a service here, they're going to know what we believe about the Bible. It's not Missio Day, you know, Christian church. Well, they're going to know what we believe about Christ. Amen? So, a life of listening. John 8, verse 47. Jesus says, the one who is from God listens to God's words. We recognize God's word because people, God's people listen to it, and just as we recognize God's people because they listen to God's word. Isn't it fun to listen to God's word together? And I get to spend the week pull, pulling out, like, okay, John wrote 2,000 years ago. Here I am, 2017. How does this apply to us? And then I come and go, blah! And you guys go, that makes sense! And we leave. And then we go, when's the next time we can get together? Okay, we're going back in. What does this say? Man, that's confusing. What is it? What is it? Oh, yeah, go back. And then all the dead dots get connected, and it's like paint by numbers. And, you know, we're like leaving with this cool, colorful picture and going, this is awesome. Right? It's like, maybe I'm the only one getting all giddy and excited about it, right? Like, I'm the guy in his home office, like, laughing and just going, wow, God's awesome. And I hope I bring that spirit to us because I'm nothing without the word. I'm certainly nothing without Jesus. But because we have Christ, we are men and women who are rich beyond our wildest imagination. And I, and I want us to just live in that and to soak in that and to enjoy that because greater is he who's in us than he's in the world. Amen. Christ is all. And if he's all, then that's all we need. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Oh, Father, you are truly great and awesome and wonderful, and loving, and kind, and compassionate. And, and, and all those things are evidenced in the fact that you so loved this world that you gave us your Son. And that all who would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And Lord, what a gift that is. And not just something we can just kind of chalk off our list, but something we can live in on a daily basis. Help us to experience the everlasting life today as we seek your face, as we seek to understand the, 
the, the, the teachings of Christ. Lord, thank You. Thank You for giving us truth. Thank You for a Lord and a Savior and a God and a Messiah who embodies that truth. And thank You for a Spirit that leads us into that truth. To You be the glory forever. Be magnified in our lives. Let us live for You, pointing people to Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift His face towards you and give His grace and peace and mercy forever and ever. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon, all right?